So if you've been with us for a little bit, the title for our series in the book of Philippians is Living as Citizens of Heaven. And we're going to see in our passage this morning in verse 27 of Philippians chapter 1. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead, turn to it. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to work at the first three verses, excuse me, the last three verses of this chapter before we turn the page next week to chapter 2. And we're going to see this Uh, these verses. Now, I want us to remember that Paul is writing these things while he is bound in chains, right? So he isn't in his country villa with, you know, the windows open and the birds singing and just kind of meditating and doting about, you know, what all of us people should be doing. He is in a difficult circumstance because of his belief in Christ and his witness for the gospel. And he is encouraging other people, and he is describing his joy in the midst of sorrow that the gospel is being proclaimed. And he's encouraging that church in Philippi and the church, which includes us, instructing us, not with inspiration, but with um, words that are um, God's, right? Supernatural words, not just the words of a man, but the words of the Holy speaking, Holy Spirit speaking through this man called to be an apostle. And it is profound. They are encouraging and they are instructive. So I don't know what all the circumstances are in your life today. I know some of the circumstances. Some are excellent. Some are just awful. But we have prayed that God would meet us and he has and he is and he will today. And the prayer is that you would hear something, and perhaps you already have that. Take it to heart, and that God would be speaking to us, and that we would take His Word seriously. I have learned to pray that God would give us ears to hear what He's saying. That the soil of our soul would be prepared, the stony places and the weedy places and the shallow places and the hard places would be removed so that God's word would penetrate our soul and in so doing grow, right, that there would be a harvest of righteousness. One of the images we use as a congregation that God has called us in many ways to be a greenhouse, a place in which God's seed is planted in our hearts and grows, and that we would grow in maturity, and we would grow in faith, and we would grow in producing the fruit of His Spirit so that the nations may be glad. God's work in you It's for you, but it's not about you, okay? It's about him and his glory and him and his kingdom and him and his goodness. And he calls us into relationship with him. He gives us the privilege of partnering together for his name's sake that his kingdom would come. It is powerful. It is profound, And the gates of hell will not overcome the church. This is the good news, and we have a part of it. And so, let's again dive into these words. Now, you're going to notice on the screen, and you're going to look um, at your Bible, and says, that isn't quite what I have, okay? So the version that I'm using today, typically I use the NIV version, which is in the pews. That's typically why I use it. They do a really good job. They do a really good job in translation. And I looked at that, and I looked at different virgi- uh, ver- <laughs> verses, versions. That's what I mean to say. I looked at different versions. I looked at the Greek. And I'm like, you know what? I think this hodgepodge, this this biblical mashup represents the text the clearest. And so today we don't have the NIV, we don't have the uh, NLT, we have the DAV. That's the Dave version. (laughs) Dave, that wasn't funny. That's the best I can do. That's the best I can do, okay? But it it is biblically accurate, and you'll see like this phrase, oh, that came from here, that phrase from, from here. So that's what's going on up here. So that's why I don't have any, you know, NIV or whatever to the next, okay? All right, let's go forward. Philippians chapter 1, 
starting with verse 27. And, okay, again, we have to remember that Paul just got done in the, in the previous paragraph about this phrase that we heard from Dionysia this morning, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he's saying, okay, we're living now. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's do this. And it gives us practical ways in which we can live as citizens of heaven. Okay, so Philippians 1, 27. He starts this way, this way. whatever happens. <laughs> I love that. Whatever happens, you underlined, must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stop, okay? This is another great verse to memorize, right? Whatever happens, right? Live as a citizen of heaven, and that is the action point. Live as a citizen of heaven. Now, this doesn't mean live as a Christian when everything goes well, okay? It doesn't mean live as a Christian when you've got enough sleep and your gas tank is full and your stomach is full and you're looking forward to this upcoming vacation, right? Now, are we to live as citizens of heaven that way? Of course. But it also means that we live as citizens of heaven when the neighbor's dogs continue to bark, when you just lost your job, when your acne is on full flare-up, and your knees aren't working well, right? And you're uncertain about your marriage, and you're wondering about your children or grandchildren, right? Live as a citizen of heaven all the time. Watch ever happens, right? Now, we say it's easier to do it on Sunday morning for an hour and a half or two hours or three hours, however long you're here. But this is in the totality of life, in the mountaintops and the valleys and all of the scope of our existence and our reality. Make it your aim to live as a citizen of heaven. Now, this language is, is curious, and it's helpful, and it's important. Now, most of us, if not all of us, are citizens of this country. I am grateful that I'm a citizen of this country. I'm grateful for the values that we have. I'm grateful for the freedom I have. I'm grateful for the good things that this country has done in the world. I was born into this country, right? It was part of my birthright, and as I grew, I learned the language, I adopted the values, I obeyed the laws, I loved the people. I'm a part of this community because I was born into it. Now here's the even better news. When you are, here's the word, born again, you're born again into a different country. You become now a citizen of a better country than even the country we are currently in. We're into now a heavenly country. That citizenship trumps this citizenship. As important as this is, that's more important because this is temporal. That is eternal. This is ultimately the place where you belong. This country is your temporary, temporary home. Your apartment or your house or wherever you live, it's temporary. And some of you say, praise God, I hate this place. <laughs> or don't like it. Some of you say, I really love my garden. <laughs> temporary. Ultimately, you are born into a new kingdom where it has a language, okay? It has values. It has ways of conduct. It has a community of people to love. It has a great and glorious king who's perfect and will reign forever. Paul, the Holy Spirit, God himself, wants us to think this way. Whatever happens, you must live as a citizen 
of heaven as an ambassador to earth. You guys understand a diplomat or an ambassador? You understand how this works, right? Some of you do. You're like, is that rhetorical? Okay, this is how it works. Right? If you are sent out as a diplomat or an ambassador, the country then um, bequeaths upon you the awesome responsibility of representing the country. So, for instance, if you are a diplomat or an ambassador of America and you go to Indonesia, where you are is where the United States of America is because you represent the country. You speak for the country. You have the authority of the country, and that is extended to you regardless of where you live because you are representing another place. You are an ambassador of heaven. I want you to think like that. God, how can I best represent you in this situation? Do you think that way? I'm asking you to think this way. God, what values that I know about your heart and I know from your word? God, how can I represent them in my workplace, in my school, in my marriage, with my siblings, or whatever it is? You have a citizenship that is eternal and is greater, and we must think like that and correspondingly act like that, live a life worthy of the gospel, right? What, what, what's that, right? Well, the gospel, we know, is the good news about Jesus Christ, right? We understand that, and we look to him, the author and the finisher of our faith, fixing our eyes on him. So we talk about redemption in Christ. We represent the reality of the sinful nature that we have inherited being just born into this world. We talk about God's grace. We talk about God's justice. We talk about eternal life or eternal death. Jesus gives an opportunity for all people to come into his kingdom to be citizens of heaven and sons and daughters of God. It's incredible. And this is the message of the gospel. And to live worthy means to ascribe worth to. So we're saying, I value and um, um, uh, treasure the gospel, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, more than any other thing. You understand this, right? And the other things are important, but they're less important. God, help us to live in such a way as kingdom citizens of the heaven to represent him well and live worthily giving worth to Christ, right? Now, do you do that perfectly? I don't either. There are times in which I fall short. I told a story on myself last week of being impatient or being short-wicked or being rude, or arrogant, or self-righteous, or whatever, right? God, help us, redeem us, sanctify us. God, help my conduct to be in line with my convictions. Help my behavior to be in line with my beliefs, right? Help me to put these things together. In so doing, there is power and God helps us and calls us and encourages us and convicts us and helps us. God, help us to live this way, conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And again, this is not optional. You must live as citizens of heaven. Underline that. Think about that. What does that mean for you? These things matter, and may we love our king and that kingdom more than we love this world. That as you die, that your affections will go stronger because you're moving towards your home, not away from it. You're moving towards your treasure, not away from it. Paul knew this, lived like this, encourages us to do the same thing and to act and live 
accordingly. So just ask that question. Make this a prayer. God, help me to live in a manner worthy of the gospel today. What if you started your day that way? Would that be, you think, a little bit better? Silence. It would be better. It might be another good one to tape onto your mirror, right? <laughs> or put on the cover of your, of your cell phone. Before you look at it, you look at that. Right? It'll help you. Right? I'm just saying. And then you engage in your day regardless of what happens. Your goal is not that everyone treats you well. The goal is that you will represent Christ well. Right? The only person that can stop you from doing that lives really close to you. Oh, wait, it is you, right? Only us. So this is how Paul opens this section. Live this way. Then he gives us some practical help. What, again, does this look like congregationally as a church? So this is Philippians chapter 1, verses 27. We're going to continue with the second part of that verse down to 28. Then, okay, if you do this, and Paul is, again, speaking from prison, whether I come to see you, Philippians, or hear about you in my absence, because he really didn't know, even though he thought he was going to be restored. He's saying, hey, do this regardless. He says, if you do this, then I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28 without being intimidated, intimidated in any way by those who oppose you. Now this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed. Whoa. But that you will be saved. And that, by God. Okay. So let's stop there. So there's two instructions for us to pay attention to. Number one, stand firm in one spirit. Now to stand firm means that you are ready for action and you're prepared for anything. If you're a baseball player, they call it baseball ready, that you are ready for anything, kind of up on your toes, ready to move, paying attention to what's happening because that ball can come anywhere at any time and you got to be ready in a split second. This is the same type of language. Be ready, stand firm. That means paying attention to what Christ is doing, paying attention to what's happening in the world, being ready to respond in a way that is appropriate to a citizen of heaven. He says, hey, 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 stand firm in one spirit. Now this translation, I think this was the NIV, put S in a capital. Often when they do that, they're talking about the Spirit of God, okay? Now, is that true? And different translators say, well, it's actually both. And they said, well, we're going to put it big to emphasize that, which I get. So being, standing firm in one spirit has two applications. Number one, that we would share the same spirit with one another, having the same mind, having the same goal. And by the way, next week you're going to see that, right? We're going to see that in chapter 2. He brings that out more. Setting the base here, he says, hey, stand firm together, right? Be connected together. Here's the deal. You need the church. I hear you, Deb, back there. She's clapping. Look into my eyes now. You need the church. We need each other for encouragement. We need each other to spur each other on towards love and good deeds. deeds. We need each other to confess our sins to one another and pray for each other so that we will be healed. We need each other to put our funds together to advance the gospel in various places. We need handshakes. We need counsel. We need to work together using our gifts. We need the strength in numbers. We need the protection of the body. We need to together hear the word of the Lord and worship Him. Right? You need the church. And the church needs you. We are strong when we are together, and the number one tactic of the enemy is to divide and conquer. This is how he works. 
Yeah, and that person right next to you, they're, they kind of smell. I don't know. I maybe move over a little bit. Hey, 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 that person was looking at you a little bit funny. Hey, hey, you know what? When you pull in the parking lot and someone took your spot, yeah, that's those people. I don't think you want to be there. Right? Or, mmm, it rained a lot last night and my knee is hurting. And the magnetic pull of the inner spring, that is the mattress of the inner spring, <laughs> is strong. <laughs> it's okay. Little by little, degree by degree, <laughs> we drift. There's an intentionality of connection that takes effort. I value this because I value Christ, and I need this because I need Christ. So standing together in one spirit and in the spirit, because the Holy Spirit that's in you is the same Holy Spirit that's in me, that's in the same Holy Spirit that's in you, that's in the same Holy Spirit that's in you. The same Holy Spirit is in our kids' merit ministry. There's no junior Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit. And he connects us and seals us, teaches us and helps us stay in that. And Paul says, hey, 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 stay together, stand strong in one spirit and then strive together. This is the second thing for the faith. There's a lot of other scriptures in there that you can look at. Please look at the notes are available for you. Read these things, what we're to do. Strive together. That is work together. For the faith, we have a message. We're a part of a kingdom, right? And there's a kingdom of the world and the kingdom of Christ, and they don't always get along, okay? So we represent Him. So when we strive together for the faith, that means that we think as Christians, as a congregation, that we want the message of the gospel to permeate our city, Just like the rain we had last night, it would soak in all over the place deeply and thoroughly and broadly. I would like it if, if, say, your your grandson is here in the city, you've been praying for him for a long time. Part of that prayer is that he would, the number one prayer, that he would come to know Christ. So what would it be that he goes to the grocery store, he runs into a Christian that talks to him about Jesus, and then he goes over to work and his co-worker Talks to him about Jesus, right? And he goes down to the whatever, and he runs into another person who's talking about Jesus. He can run, but he cannot hide, right? This is what I'm talking about, right? We're a part of the team. I pray for my family members, and I pray that they will run into someone who is in love with Jesus, And they keep running into those people because I talk to them, but I want 17 other people to talk to them. Striving together for the gospel. We have an opportunity to carry this message. Do you understand how glorious that is? And it's difficult. So Paul, in this passage, to stand firm in one spirit, striving together for one faith of the gospel. This is what we do to see the gospel reach the ends of the earth. This is why we go. This is why we give. This is why we participate. And then he says, uh, without being intimidated in any way, frightened by those who oppose you. That tells me a couple things, that the enemy will try to divide us because he says, hey, stay together, keep focus, keep ready, keep moving forward. And also that there be opposition. Paul himself was facing that. Not everyone likes to hear about Jesus. Did you know that? They don't. Why? Now, talking about God generically, people are typically okay with that. Well, I praise God, right? Because that word God can mean a lot of things, right? I'm telling you, I'm just saying. People typically are like, they're okay with God. Oh, you can do that, right? Don't tell me what to do, but if you want to do that, too. When you start talking about Jesus, it gets really specific. (laughs) When the anti-Christ comes, he's not going to be anti-God. He's going to be anti-Christ. Just think about that. 
Because Christ has some significant claims. Right? Do you remember that whole book that we talked about at some point called the Gospel of John? Right? The claims of I am, the claims of being the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father by me. The claim that he makes of being the bread of life. The claim that he made about being the water of life. The claim that he made about being the good shepherd and saying before Abraham was, I am. You remember that, right? Talking about Christ and that everyone is for him or for Christianity or the king of Christianity in this claim. So there will be those who oppose you, but don't be intimidated. And then he goes on and said, well, this is the sign. What's the sign? That you continue to strive together for the gospel, that you continue to stand together in one spirit, that you continue to live in a life worthy of the gospel, that you continue to act like a citizen of heaven, you continue to do that, right? It's a sign to them for what? That they will be destroyed? <laughs> and that you will be saved, and you're saved not by your own merit, not by your own worthiness, you're saved because of God's merit and God's worthiness, right? That is by God, so our continuation, our perseverance in the faith tells people something that, hmm, there's got to be something to this. Now, I remember when I really gave myself to Christ. This is at 17. And I remember um, an aunt, and actually an aunt and a cousin said, well, it's just a phase. He'll get out of it or he'll grow out of it. I love Jesus more than I did at 17. Why? Because I have, whatever, 35 years of experiencing him and growing in him and knowing him and seeing him and cherishing him and hearing from him and spending time with him. I love him more, not less. It's a sign that there's something happening. These people believe this so much so that they're willing to give up things. They're willing to go to places. They're willing to, like, you know, do stuff and think different ways. It's a sign that there is something different markedly because of the Spirit. It's a sign. Those in the kingdom will be saved by God and those outside who oppose it will not. These are strong things. Granted, we are communicating the gospel, but not everyone receives it. And so our perseverance, our connectiveness, our love of the Lord matters because what we do communicates. God helps us, gives us strength for this, invites us to us, and this is our privilege. This is the last point, and Paul continues in this way. Verse 29, so see how these things fit together. Read this in context of this chapter. He ends this chapter this way. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege for suffering for Him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle, Paul was saying, in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it stop. Still there saying these things. Right? So the point of this is I want us to embrace the privilege of salvation and suffering. Right? So let's talk about this a little bit. <laughs> Which of these two Salvation or suffering, are you more, more prone to embrace? You better say salvation. <laughs> I like that. I like the power of that. I like receiving that. It is good news that I will win in the end because of Christ, the victor. 
I'm a part of his team. And because of being part of his team, there is victory, there is salvation, and there is a privilege to be a Christian. And you say, amen to that. Privilege. A blessing, not a burden. A strengthening. And an equipping and a calling and a producing. It's all of these promises of God are ours in Christ. It is a privilege. And also it is a privilege to be a part of that team. And this is the word. It's a privilege to suffer. The apostles understood this. When they were proclaiming Christ in the streets and the leaders and the authorities came against them and they were beaten and they were imprisoned and they got out, they said, it's a privilege to suffer for Christ, right? Because they belong to him. I played sports when I was in high school, right? We had a really good football team, right? It was so good that we did not lose a home game for 10 years, right? And they, the the families like grew and groomed their kids to play football, right? Pick up football games all the time, flag football games all the time. So when you became a junior high, you've already been knowing the plays because you've been playing them in backyard for a decade, right? We were good, right? You're going to laugh at me, but our, but our uh, mascot was a kilowatt. <laughs> like that light bulb head guide with the, you know, have you seen this? You get, some of you are looking at me like, what the heck are you talking about? Okay. Anyway, you can look it up. You won't, but it's okay. It's this lightning bolt guy. Okay. We're called the kilowatts. It was a privilege to be that, right? It was a privilege to put on that helmet and to have that logo, right? It meant But every other team wanted to destroy us, right? They wanted to be the team to break that record. They wanted not just to break the record, they wanted to break our legs, right? I'm not kidding you. (laughs) And so, in carrying that logo, that name, there was a privilege to be a part of this team. We won together and we suffered together and it was a privilege to suffer together. You have been privileged to bear the name of Christ, to have his image. You and I have that. It's a privilege. And it's also a privilege to suffer alongside Christ in the trenches of life as we look to move the gospel ball forward until the last second ticks off the clock and the game's over and we get to enjoy the parade forever. Do you consider it a privilege? When people mistreat you because they know you're a Christian. I typically don't. But this helps me, right? Well, okay, now if you're being mistreated because you're a Christian, that's a good thing. If you're being mistreated because you're a jerk, that's on you. (laughs) I'm being mistreated because I'm a Christian. No, because you're a liar. Stop it. Let's hear me. But if you're representing Christ and things happen to you, eh, God says, count it as a privilege that you're worthy to suffer. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy. Acts 5, 41, I already talked about this. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. So embrace the privilege of salvation and stand up, stand together, strive for the gospel because it is worth it. Paul encourages us this way and again, he's not saying these things from, you know, you minor Christians, 
few less than the Apostle Paul from his gated community. He's talking about these things from a dungeon. Saying, I count suffering for Christ as greater worth than anything of this world. May we have that spirit in us. And I don't know what's going on in you. I don't know what perhaps may be blocking you. My first guess is that you haven't beholded Christ clearly. Because if you see Christ and His goodness, and you taste and see that the Lord is good, everything else pales, right? So I'm not telling you, you you know, grab your bootstraps and go out there, soldier. I'm not telling you that. I'm saying behold Christ and fall in love with Him more. And if you do, you can't help but live for Him and tell people about Him. You understand that, right? (laughs) Christianity at its core is not a morality improvement program. It is a life transformational truth about a king and a kingdom and His eternal reign and His glory and His goodness. His grace and His justice and His truth and His beauty. So my prayer is that we would fall in Christ, in love with Christ more. That we couldn't help but tell other people about Him. We couldn't help but think about Him. We couldn't help but stand for Him. That's the right way. And Paul says, continue to do these things. So the best conclusion I have, by the way, is in the, in the questions for the growth groups that are the small groups that we have here as a church. I encourage you to participate. If you're looking for things to think about, look at the bottom of your notes and read them. I'm not going to read them for you now, but I, these are good questions, right? Hold to something, at least one thing from our passage today. We're going to pray, we're going to sing, we're going to have a benediction, but think about this. Let the love of the Lord and value of your heavenly citizenship be greater and better and treasured more than anything of this world. Let us stand firm together in one spirit and one faith for the sake of the message of the gospel and the kingdom of Christ. And let us wholeheartedly embrace both salvation and the privilege of suffering so that Christ may be glorified and proclaimed to the world. Let's pray. I'm so grateful for these precious people that I know their names, I know where they live, that we can connect in this place. So grateful that you have given us your word and that we have it in a language we understand. So grateful for those who have gone before us, like the Apostle Paul, who after hearing the message of Christ, after being someone who persecuted the gospel, was converted after seeing you and hearing you, you changed him because this is what you do. Thank you for affecting our heart. God, thank you for the privilege of salvation. God, also thank you for the privilege of partnering with you. God, help us in our suffering for the gospel. Help us to be of one spirit. Help us to strive together until we are in your presence with the angels and the multitudes and all creation singing worthy is the Lamb. Jesus, you are worthy, so open our eyes more to see you, to behold you, to love you, God. Do that here, do it in my heart, in our hearts, more and more and more. Thank you for the goodness of the gospel and those who spoke it even to my heart and to our hearts. Help us to carry this message for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.